Hello. Hi, Rod. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Are you joining us from, from Australia or in the U.S.? I am in Colorado in the U.S. Ah, awesome. What time is it over there? It is 7.20 in the evening. Ah, nice one. <laughs> All right. So Rod um, is the CTO of Proof of Software, and today he's going to talk to us about multi-grain services. Um, over to you, Rod. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Oops. Thank okay. You. All right. I will jump right in then. So we've heard a lot about microservices and monoliths, and it seems to be it's a microservices are good, monoliths are bad kind of thing. And I think what we'll talk about in this session is that it's a it depends answer, right? There's a it depends on the job, the team, the time frame, et cetera. So we're gonna look at some of the pros and cons of each of these and maybe help you make uh, better decisions when you're choosing an architecture. So real quick on me, I'm perforce uh, CTO. We make software tools and, and platforms, including things like Akana API management. I was a CTO of RugWave, founder and CTO of OpenLogic in the open source space. And I've been around a long time with uh, big companies, some small ones, and speaking at events all over the world, including API Days Melbourne, Last year, I'd love to be there. This year, maybe next time. Okay, so first to test. You didn't know there'd be a quiz, but here it comes. So which is better? Option A, it's big, it's bulky, it's hard to update, but you can figure out what it's trying to do. It's the monolith. Or option B, they're tiny. They only do one thing. They're easy to replace and upgrade, but you have to monitor them constantly and good luck trying to figure out the big picture. They're the microservices. Or option C, they're different sizes, ranging from big to huge. They're legacy and modern all mixed together. They make a purist head swim, but they're pretty practical. They're the macro and mini services. So you can probably guess it depends on what you're trying to do. What problem are you trying to solve? Determines what kind of an architecture is best. So to look a little bit deeper before we take a, a, a really deep dive into each of these microservices, focused on typically very small chunks of functionality, features. You can have their own runtime, their own data store, written in different languages, use different platforms. The key is no sharing. They're independent. Many services, a little bigger, maybe a collection of features, maybe the shopping cart of an e-commerce app or the microservice maybe is just looking up the cost of shipping. Uh, many services can share things like app servers or data stores, languages, etc., but try to keep them small. Then you get to the macro services or the, the monoliths that you're sort of decomposing, maybe using a strangler pattern and slowly pulling off functionality into many of your microservices. But in their big form, they cover entire domains and they share typically everything, app server, data store, etc. And on the right, you get looser coupling and greater agility. That's what everybody wants from microservices. But on the left, you get lower complexity, easier to deploy, easier to run, easier to get your head around. So there are definitely pros and cons. So the, the point of this talk is to think multi-grain, not just microservices. They look great on your uh, history and experience when you're trying to get a job. Sure, everybody wants them, but try to choose the best tool for the job. Okay, so first the monolith gets a bad rap. Uh, here's an example of what you might think of when you think monolith. It's horrible, huge spaghetti code. It's completely incomprehensible, but it doesn't have to be that way. Monoliths can be well uh, thought out, layered, composed architectures uh, using very good principles and practices. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to consider the traditional three-tier application, you know, client, app server, web server, database, as a monolith, because a lot of times, if you change one thing, you have to change it all. It's not easy to scale independent functions. It tends to be thought of as one thing. So we're gonna think of that as a monolith for this talk. And historically, uh, thanks to Conway's law, typically whatever your organizational structure looks like, that's what your architecture looks like. So if you have UI front end people, business logic, middle tier system analyst type people, and DBAs, in, in the days of relational databases or people who admin the database, 
you typically end up with a three-tier siloed architecture. Doesn't again doesn't have to be that way. So again, people tend to think of monolith and monolithic culture as command and control, top-down, big teams, developers versus DBAs or versus QA, very antagonistic, waterfallish, slow, big design up front, heavy, lots of uh, slow testing environments, very slow deployment cadence, maybe once a year, once every 18 months or two years, and vertical scalability by a new set of hardware if you want it to go faster. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. You could use Agile or scaled Agile with feature teams, frequent automated testing, automated releases, um, DevOps, CI, CD, horizontal scalability. These are also possible with monoliths. Now, some of the advantages of monoliths uh, versioning issues. You typically have one of the major applications, databases, database versions, framework versions, etc. in the app. Right? It's one big thing. You also tend to get lower latency. It's just in-memory type calls away uh, from one function to another. You're not going over a network. You also get the advantage of oftentimes you don't have to worry about things like uh, XA, two-phase commit, distributed transactions, uh, saga, path, saga patterns, eventual consistency, compensating operations, all those rather challenging things that can bring excruciating pain at some point uh, in, in some applications. Again, you don't typically have to deal with that if you have one data store, one set of code. The other big advantage I think of a monolith is it tends to have one, one code base, one set of artifacts, one build, everybody's kind of rowing together typically one language or the same small set of languages, one platform, one tool chain, et cetera. It's easy to move people from one sub team to another because you're using all the same stuff, typically using it about the same way. Now the challenges, which is why it's driven people away from monoliths historically, no small changes. A lot of times you, you make one change, add one feature, it ripples through, through the, everything. You can get locked into tech stacks that can be old. You want to try something new? You can't easily do that because you have to change everything or nothing. Scale all or nothing. Uh, it's not easy to just uh, roll out new, let's say the zip code lookup service or shipping service. No, you have to duplicate the entire stack, uh, even if you only wanted to scale one little bit of it. it. Tends to be heavyweight deployment or can be. Maybe you have uh, HA setups that are very manual, time consuming, not fully automated, using RAID, kind of uh, things that make it not so easy to deal with in development and QA and uh, staging and cloud environments. Version coordination, you might have one version of your database or your ma major app server components deployed, but all the teams have to agree on that version, that can be challenging. You can have one bug take down the entire app, because again, if it's all one code base, essentially one big chunk of business logic, a bad bug can take down everything. And maybe container concerns. Maybe you can't use containers. You'd like to. You'd like to use Docker and Kubernetes uh, and other, uh, other uh, options along those lines, surface meshes, but you can't. Again, sometimes you need physical devices or VMs for big heavyweight monoliths. So best practices, if you're on a monolith, still use Agile, use DevOps, automate, use proper <laughs> um, segmentation, isolate what you can architecturally, layers and modules, scale horizontally if you can, use development deployment accelerators in the Java world, things like JRebel, so you don't have slow um, compile, build, deploy, reset uh, states and uh, processes when you just need to test something quick. So use the tools you can uh, if you're in a monolithic world. Okay, before we look at microservices, many services, microservices. Let's look at what are services. Well, it all started with SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. Been around a long time, has a bad name, but the intent was always it's a service. It's a self-contained black box. It's business activity, right? It's what we think of as the best kind of a use of APIs today, typically. Distributed, separately maintained and deployed, independent, can be independent languages, frameworks, again, all the good things we like now about APIs and microservices. And it wasn't originally about things like SOAP and ESBs and, and WSR and all the heavy process central control vendor lock-in. It turned into that 
it, it became a big, hairy, nasty mess that nobody wanted to deal with that was very slow and heavyweight. But that's not the original intent of SOA. And so I think it's making a bit of a comeback. Right? The term itself still makes sense. You just implement it correctly, you get a better result. Okay, so microservices. I think in a nutshell, I think microservices is like the Unix philosophy. Philosophy. You do one thing and you do it well. And then you connect a bunch of those little things together to create a bigger system. I think of it as SOA for distributed teams in a world of DevOps. It's a lot of, a lot of things in that uh, sentence to unpack, but it's about automation, auto scale, doing it right. We'll talk more about that. And found in context, domain driven design, again, because you have to have good, crisp, clean isolation. You don't want any slippery uh, slides back to a monolith. You have to be careful about that. So where's a monolith? We talked about this. Puts all the functionality in a single process, all the different things you're doing. Uh, and if you need to scale it up, you scale up everything with a microservice. You scale up just what you need. You have a lot more resilience in the system. You pay for that in terms of latency and other things which we'll talk about, but you do get better resiliency overall. But characteristics, I think it's processes talking over the network. Maybe you can use IPC, shared memory, OSGI containers like Akana uses, but the, the concept is uh, typically isolated, independent things talking over uh, general protocols. Independently deployed, easy to replace, organized around capabilities, so you can have small teams focus on what they're good at. They don't have to learn everything which is also good and bad. Independently implemented, so you can use the language of the day or the new platform or the new data store, whatever you think is best um, for your environment. You're not stuck on what everybody else on the team uses, for example. Small message enabled, context bounded, autonomously developed, decentralized, a lot of words, all the good stuff, automated, elastic, resilient, composable, minimal, complete. So a lot of benefits, that's what excites everybody about microservices, but all this stuff isn't free. Okay, loosely coupled, this is the one that trips up most teams, I think, that, that struggle with microservices. You can't share the data storage, right? Why? If one team wants to change the schema, wants to change the data store, another team is not ready. Now the, those two services move in lockstep, you lost the independent deployability, you lost a bunch of the benefits of microservices. Ideally, also, you're not using any synchronous communication. No REST HTTP because you don't want cascading timeouts if something goes wrong. So you need to use asynchronous messaging and deal with the results. Eventual consistency compensating operations um, can be challenging. It's not uh, no free lunch. So if you look at SOA you know, back in the 2009 timeframe versus microservices now, I think SOA was more about business value. Microservices are more a technical implementation. It's strategic goals versus project specific. Interoperability versus custom integration. Shared services and reuse versus implementation, specific purpose. They both favor flexibility and evolutionary refinement, but you can kind of see the, the big differences there. Um, SOA was tended to be slower and heavier because you're trying to coordinate upfront. Microservices are more about get it done, don't worry so much about reuse. So advantages of microservices, you're dealing with small problems. You're biting off one bite-sized thing, uh, typically with a small team. So it's you have low overhead, low communication overhead, easy to get on the same page most of the time. And you come up with small solutions, easy to get your head around. You can understand all the moving parts. You can use the best tool for the job. The hot new tech comes out, you can try it. You're not starting from scratch with a major multi-year uh, project. You can explore. Now, this does come with a cost. You have to make a lot of decisions up front. And, and I see a lot of people kind of rush into microservices that don't think about this. And they wind up reinventing a lot of wheels. Like, do we use a service mesh? Do we use uh, an Istio, a Linkerd? Do we implement resilience patterns? You have timeouts, bulkheads, circuit breakers, just retries. How do we communicate? Is this, are we using GraphQL? Are we using uh, gRPC, HTTP, REST? What are, what are we doing? Uh, how do we manage state? Are we dealing with eventual consistency and saga patterns? Kubernetes stateful sets, um, AWS services, data stores on VMs, uh, big NAS or SAN installations, 
how do we coordinate across teams and deal with versioning and SLAs and life cycles and, and end of life? And how do we notify each other when something uh, is going away or uh, uh, an API is changing or being added or responsibilities being split or, or merged across teams? How do we move people from team to team when we're using totally different languages and platforms and, and frameworks? Do we use Kubernetes serverless and which serverless nano services service mesh, which service mesh? And how do we manage and deploy all this stuff? How do we deal with logging, tracing, monitoring, network, uh, metrics, reporting? Are we each, is every team making all these decisions on their own? You're gonna wind up with dozens and dozens and dozens of different combinations of tools. Again, makes it challenging when you wanna reuse, move people around, learn and understand your system. So some of the challenges, it is true distributed computing and all that comes with you know, it used to be um, in the cognitive load sense, I wanted to use somebody else's code. I just make a function call, use their class, whatever you, you, method, whatever you want to call it in your, your language term of choice. Now you're going over the net network. There's latency involved. Um, I may bake in some assumptions that this is local to me and now it got moved. Things got really slow. Right. Um, it's easy to bake in those assumptions about the environment that get out of date quickly. I can have a service explosion. If I've got hundreds of services, how do I find out about them? How do I search? How do I avoid duplication? I can have lots of different tech eco, eco, uh, ecosystems and languages, etc., to deal with an explosion. Hard to get my head around everything. And in team dynamics with microservices, it's really easy to kind of stare down and get your thing working and say, well, our microservices, are perfect, they're up 100% of the time, and you say, that's great, but the company went out of business because all the pieces didn't fit together. We didn't succeed as a team overall. Because it's distributed computing, the fallacies of distributed computing come into play, especially number two, my favorite one to harp on, latency is zero. Latency is not zero, and latencies add up. They pile up on you pretty quickly. All right, so culture, ideally with microservices, heavily, heavily automated, too many moving parts to deal with by hand, network uh, changes and configurations, services going up and down all the time. You have to have true DevOps, um, developers ideally responding to issues, deep monitoring, self-healing, anti-fragility, uh, site reliability engineering, all those things are, are critical. And you have to embrace failure. There's no more, well, I hope it stays up. Right. Once your system is large enough, you're always in a state of partial failure in recovery all the time. You just have to embrace that. So you need timeouts and retries and circuit breakers and those bulkheads and other patterns for resiliency because you're always in that state. So best practices, automate absolutely everything. Use service meshes. Use API management. That doesn't go away. And ideally, you start with a monolith first because it's easier to understand what you're trying to do, what problem you're trying to solve, the business benefits. Uh, if you start with a monolith, it's easier to get your head around and, and think less about the tech and more about the business value you're bringing. Then later, if you need to, you can carve out microservices and, and, and move to that new architecture as you succeed. Okay, so quickly API management still needed because API management is about the external facing world. It's about you know opening the floodgates to all the users on the internet, you want consistent security for all your services, all your mini services, macro services, microservices, et cetera, all your APIs. Have it deal with protocol transforms and authentication, authorization, quality of service, analytics, data transformation, et cetera. So you don't have to deal with that at the individual API level. You don't want to invent all those wheels again and again for every API, just like internally with a service mesh. You want your service mesh to handle all the networking, communication, retries, the resiliency pattern, traffic management, telemetry collection, configuration, all that stuff, again, should be handled for you so you can just focus on the individual microservice and not reinvent those wheels. So API management, I think of externally focusing, uh, externally focused, centralized with security stability as the keys. Service mesh, it's internal, lots of them, Lots of different teams, lots of different languages and experiments, that's fine, focused on flexibility and availability of individual services.
And then the APIs, of course, call the microservices to get their work done. Okay, I think this is uh, predictions that this is where we're going. It's challenging to get there, but lots of companies want to move to microservices for the benefits. You just have to pay the cost, right? So use service mesh and, uh, and think about how do you handle the ramp up in the overhead of microservices? Because initially, you know, the base complexity of microservices are higher than with a monolith. They're just move, more moving parts, you know, more tech, stacks, more languages, more decisions to make up front, getting on the on the same page with all the teams. So a monolith, you can kind of hit the ground running. It's very, most people understand how they work. You can, you can get your head around it pretty easily and start making progress towards business value. Now, over time, as a monolith gets bigger and more unwieldy and slower and heavier, that's when the microservices start to shine. But there is that initial period where you are paying a tax for microservices up front and Depending on your, your time frame, what you're trying to achieve and when, you may not want to pay that tax up front. You may want to go with monolith and then convert. So summary of API and service mesh. API management and service mesh, they address different needs, external versus internal. They're both critical for microservices architectures, but there's no one size fits all solution. You know, kind of best of breed on the API management side tends to be the commercial tools, things like uh, Akana, you know, world-class scale, you know, enterprise features, stability, security, reliability, those kind of things. Uh, on the service mesh side, open source is dominant there. Things like uh, Istio and there are other ones coming online to help with your microservices implementations themselves. So use, use both. Okay, many services. This is somewhere in the middle, right? We looked, we looked at the monolith, we looked at microservices. Many services are more about a bundle of microservices. They serve sort of one business function you can think of it as kind of a fat container that relaxes some of the constraints, right? Where you think of um, the ability to share some data store, the ability to uh, share schemas, to use synchronous communications, because it's, again, sort of tightly coupled, a, a group of services. Maybe you have all one slightly larger team working on them. So a little bit tighter interaction so it's possible to get away with some of those and, and avoid issues maybe like with eventual consistency and saga patterns and compensating operations that are hard to get right. Big one, of course, you can share data stores. That's the constraint for microservices that can be relaxed a little bit. Some advantages here, less culture shock, not as extreme as microservices, tends to, to value the business results over architectural purity, and you can use traditional communication style. Now, there's obviously downsides there. You can you can easily slip from a mini service and, and just say, well, let's add one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. You wind up with a monolith. So you have to use quite a bit of discipline there if you're gonna go that route. So to kind of bring it back, think multi-grain and not just micro. Again, with microservices, looser coupling, greater agility, but with the other side of the spectrum, lower complexity, easier to run. So I think in terms of this chart is about just, as it says in the top left, grok, grokking, getting your head around what's going on. You know, some of the wins in the monolith column are, you understand the architecture. There's three pieces. It's simple. Everybody gets it. You can draw it on a whiteboard. Uh, microservices architecture, you might have hundreds of them. There's a thousand arrows. Nobody can draw that. Right? Downsides of monosurfaces or monolith microservices, reuse and change, very hard, very slow. That's the real sweet spot of microservices where things move quickly, they do well because they're built for change. Um, deployment versioning, again, goes with the simpler side. Many services are a lot of question marks there. It depends on how you do it. Are your many services almost microservices or are they almost monoliths? So kind of in conclusion here, I think the one size fits all approach is wrong. You hear all the time, everything's going to microservices. That's the only way to do it. You have to go that route. I think that's wrong. It, it doesn't fit every problem. It's not the best tool for every job. So consider your needs. What's your problem? What are you trying to solve? How big is this? Is this a, a, a 10 year looking out issue or is this a one year kind of a horizon? You know, if, if you can't even spell Kubernetes or Istio or Kafka, you're gonna waste a lot of time trying to get microservices uh, architecture up and running when you could hit the ground quickly based on your team, your experience, and your time frame, 
um, you, you may do better to start with something else, monolith, mini service, macro service. Um, and if you have, let's say, for example, the business says you've got six weeks to prove value and it takes you five weeks to get all the moving parts up and running uh, with a complex microservices architecture, not the right choice. So think about what are you solving? What is your team's experience with these things? And what's your time frame? That will help you pick the right decision, right path. So with that, I'll say we do have a quick start for Akana if you want to get going on the API management side, which you're going to need an API management solution regardless of uh, whether you implement with microservices or not. Uh, we do have a quick start to get you up and running uh, in the cloud. We also have on-prem solutions and hybrids where you can get the best of both worlds. And with that, I think I will turn it back over to Julia and see if we have... Thank you, Ross. That was a great talk. Um, I've got a question here from Rashmi. Um, what is your opinion on the number of APIs or microservices developed in, a, in an organization? And how much is too much? And how do you decide when to stop or refactor to merge? Mm, OK. Well, I think um, the way I interpret that question, a lot of people think about every microservice is an API. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think um, microservices should be internal. They're implementation detail or how you solve the problem. APIs are what you expose um, typically to the outside world or a different part of the organization that's not near the implementers. So you should have a lot fewer APIs maybe than you have microservices. Now, once you know they ask about the number, I'd say if you're up in the, the thousands, that's an awful lot, unless you're a massive multinational corporation, probably too many. If you have 10, that's probably not enough. So I'd say it's somewhere between 10 and 1,000 is probably a, a, a good area for kind of a, a range for sort of externally focused APIs. Microservices, probably you know, typically in the hundreds range is, is kind of what I see. Great. Uh, I've got another question here. It's a good one. Um, what's your thoughts on data complexity, especially when you have a lot of um, different microservices or different multi-grain services around? Yeah, that's. I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges with microservices are if every team who implements a microservice gets to choose their own data store, then you will almost immediately have every data store imaginable. You'll have... Uh, every NoSQL database, every SQL database, every in-memory database, and all the teams will go about it differently. And now let's say you need to, as a higher level service, uh, orchestrate a transaction across multiple services. And you've got this very complex mesh, what well, could turn it into a mess of uh, different data stores and different teams doing transactions in their own way. Um, it's really hard, hard problem to solve. You have you have to deal with eventual consistency, compensating operations, saga patterns, um, dealing with monitoring of events. Maybe you're using asynchronous messaging and Kafka queues, et cetera. You have to have lots of monitors. Have has a message been dropped? Did something time out? Do we need to re-inject uh, a message? And so it's, it's very easy to go back towards almost the ESB type days because that becomes so difficult. Um, so my advice is, you know, again, use the best tool for the job. Don't, don't pick uh, every data store imaginable if you can reuse something, if you can share, if you can maybe do two or three things with a small service and, instead of just one. That will take a little bit of that cognitive load off and, uh, and make data management and transactions a little bit easier to deal with. But it's going to be hard. Definitely. I've got one more question here. Um, what are your recommendations for managing the drawbacks or downsides of microservices, such as monitoring, deployment, versioning? Yeah, mon monitoring, deployment, and versioning. Well, I'd say, first of all, choose a service mesh. That makes a lot of problems easier to deal with. If you pick uh, an Istio, Linkerd, there's, there's some new ones coming online. Uh, it makes some of those, some of those choices um, a little less daunting and you can share some of the decisions. So you can get standard telemetry data, um, standard resilience patterns and ways to implement them. Uh, sometimes standard monitoring uh, 
standard UIs. That makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So that, again, not every single team has their own solution for monitoring and resilience. And it makes it extremely difficult to get the big picture and to coordinate across teams. So you start with the service mesh, that'll help a lot. Um, yes, a lot of questions coming through. Um, is market services versus monolith a decision which should be made at the beginning of development, of development or could monolith slowly transition to microservices? Um, yeah, I think um, the latter. I mean, in, in a lot of cases, we've seen the most success with, with teams that start with a monolith and migrate to my, microservices as needed. I actually have uh, I've done the, uh, other talks, you know, Perforce.com, you can find webinars where I talk about exactly this, how to migrate from monolith to microservice. You can use something like the strangler pattern. So you start with your monolith, you get it working, and you find out there's an area of the monolith that is getting hard to change, it's slower, it's heavier, it's causing business problems. You're having to say, it's going to take us six months to get this new feature to the business, they don't like that. That's a good opportunity to say, okay, that area of the monolith, let's carve that out into microservices or mini services so we can go much faster in that area the next time the business needs something. Um, that's a, a more safer, I think, proven approach, approach to microservices. So start with the easy, thing that everybody can understand, get their head around, up and running, deliver value quickly. And then only when you run into problems, pull out microservices. And, and that can work pretty well. Awesome. Maybe we'll take one last one. Okay. Um, is it advised to use event-based architecture for microservices? Uh, yes. That's the short answer. Um, you, you don't want to use synchronous communication. So if you're, if you're making REST calls, for example, from one service to the next, and you have a network issue, well, then you have a timeout. And let's say you wait 30 seconds or even up to two minutes for that network connection to timeout. That, that's okay if that only happens once, but what if you're deep into a tree or a graph of calls where one service calls the next, calls the next, calls the next. Now you get this cascading timeout issues where it, it could take minutes for that whole train to fail back up to the original caller. You may have a user there waiting for an answer and waiting minutes, that doesn't work. So you, you have to use asynchronous communication and a uh, you know, messaging system makes a lot of sense. There's there's overhead, there's more things to learn there, but it, you, you almost have to go that route if you're going through microservices. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your talk today, Rod. That was really good insights. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you like it. 